الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا العبد المؤيد والرسول المسدد المصطفى الأمجد حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الغر الميامين My dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Before I begin I would like to bring this to your attention that the breakfast today has been donated by our dear sister uh, our respected and dear sister Hajj Selma Maqlid. In loving memory of her late parents, Hajj Abdul Karim, Hajj Abdul Karim Dakroub, Hajj Abdul Karim uh, Dakroub, and Hajj Faiza Fawziya Fawaz. And also on her late husband, in the memory of her late husband, Al Marhoum. Al Haj Hassan Maqlid. I would like to ask you all, my dear brothers and sisters, that we all recite Surah Al Mubarakat Al Fatiha on behalf of the three great deceased Al Marhoum, Al Haj Abdul Karim Dakroub, Haj Fawziya Fawaz, and Al Haj Hassan Maqlid Al Fatiha. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect our dear sister Hajj Salma Maqlid and grant her a prolonged healthy life insha'Allah all along with her children brother Ali, Hani and Muna may Allah bless them all Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim يا أيها الذين آمنوا قوا أنفسكم وأهليكم نارا وقودها الناس والحجارة وقودها الناس والحجارة عليها ملائكة غلاظ شداد لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم ويفعلون ما يؤمرون الله سبحانه وتعالى in this surah التحريم prohibition الله سبحانه وتعالى says oh you who believe save yourself and your family members from a fire from a fire whose fuel is man and a stone. This verse in the Quran, my dear brothers and sisters, emphasizes the need for us to, play, to pay close attention to raising our children. This is a very extremely important issue in Islam. That parents need always to focus on their duty and their responsibility toward their children. I'm not supposed to just father my kids and leave them alone and don't worry about their upbringing. As a father and as a mother, I have a responsibility in addition to fathering my children is to supervise them, 
to look after their well-being, to ensure their well-being, to make sure that they are being grazed well. This is part of my responsibility as a parent. My kids do not only need my cash that I need to spend on them so they can survive physically. Cash and money, expenditure and monetary responsibility, that's the least I'm supposed to do toward my children. I need to feed them, that's true. I need to clothe them, that's true. I need to provide them with the proper housing, that's true. But what is even more important than all those services and responsibilities is being a good father to raise my kids well. I am responsible before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. God will hold me accountable in the day of judgment if I fail in doing so. Many people say or ask how we can do that. Trust me, trust me my dear brothers and sisters. When I tell you that maybe working on a vehicle, on a spaceship at NASA to conquer the outer space is probably not more difficult, not less difficult, I'm sorry, not less difficult than raising a good child. Raising a good child takes a lot of time and effort. It does not come easy. It does not come for free. I have to work hard to be a good parent. It doesn't take me much to be a father, but it takes me a lot to become a responsible parent. A responsible father or responsible mother it takes a lot. And if you look today at our human society, one of the biggest challenges we face that is so detrimental to the future of humanity is that the failure on the part of many parents to raise their kids, to raise their kids well, to the point that is jeopardizing the future of human societies. We face rampant violence in this country. The highest rate of crimes in the world. Why is that? Have you ever asked yourself, why do we face in the most richest, sophisticated country, the most, most mightiest country on earth, Yet we have the, num the largest number of inmates, over 2 million people. Over 2 million people. Now are in jail. The largest rate, the highest rate of crimes. Why is that? Why? Part of it is because of the foundation. Because of a phenomena that is called broken homes. Part of it is because many parents in this country fail to raise their kids properly. We have become so selfish that all our focus has turned into myself instead of my family. And instead of thinking about the future of my family, my kids, all I think about myself and my selfish interest. That's why we have the highest number of divorce. In some states like California, the number, the <coughs> number of divorce, divorce rate is 50%, reaches up to 50%, meaning, meaning every year if we have 2,000 couple getting married, we have 1,000 couple getting divorced. Half the number of men and women getting married are getting divorced. 
Why is that? Why is that? Because we have become so selfish, thinking only about our interests. I always tell during my marital counseling, I tell couples who are seeking divorce, I'm not saying every divorce is bad. Sometimes there is no way out. There is no way out. There is so much abuse and there is so much harassment that there is no way out but divorce. But I tell couples who seek divorce that you need to keep in mind that if you choose divorce, there is a victim and there is a price. The victim is your kids and the price is often to lose. They say, what? To lose? No, of course we're not going to lose. I said, no, 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 no. Don't get me wrong. I don't mean you physically lose your kids. No. Physically, you're not going to lose your kids. Mentally, psychologically. They will be a completely different realm. And this is because of divorce. And I don't want to indulge in this subject because that's not my subject. That is not my primary subject today to talk about divorce. But just to bring this to your attention, psychologists and sociologists now say in this country, I'm talking about professors at Yale University and Stanford, they say that the negative impact of divorce would continue impacting the children for at least 25 years after divorce. At least 25 years. So, how do we cope with that? How do we manage to raise good family and good children? This is a very important subject, my dear brothers and sisters. Number one, there are a few tips, my dear brothers and sisters. Number one, when I have kids, I have to learn the art of listening to my kids. A mother came to me a while ago and she says, Sayyid, I have a problem with my kids not listening to me. I said to her, do you listen to your kids? Do you listen to them? You want them to listen to you. Do you ever listen to them? Do you listen to their concerns? Sometimes parents think that things are rosy and great with their children. You ask them, how is your their, uh, kid's situation? They tell you, perfect. Any problem? No problem. Not because there are no problems, simply because they don't know. They have not listened to their children and their concerns. We need to learn how to listen to our children's concerns. We need to open our ears wide open. See Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, in one verse, says, وَلَا تَقْفُ مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ إِنَّ السَّمْعَ وَالْبَصَرَ وَالْفُؤَادِ كُلُّ أُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ عَنْهُ مَسْؤُولَ Allah begins before mentioning our vision, our sighting, and our comprehension ability, he refers to our hearing ability. He created hearing for you. And then he mentions visions. So, why is that? Some, I heard some scholars say, because when a baby is formed, when the fetus is born, the first limb in his body that takes shape is what? Is his ears. Do you know that? So that's why God in the Quran begins with hearing. He made hearings for you. But in fact, there could be more than this. Not because God started our formation by creating our ears. That could be true. But there is another reason. And that is to bring our attention to the importance of listening. Sometimes we just love to talk. We forget to 
listen. I just want my kids to hear me and listen to me without me listening to them. If I want my kids to listen to me, then I have to listen to their concerns. I have to see what's, what's wrong and what is going on. I have to give them the ability to express their opinion, to vent out. That's why, my dear brothers and sisters, I always say parents need to be not only parents to their children, rather also friends. Friends in which our kids can confide. When my child, God forbid, is going through difficult time, he needs to come to me before going to a psychiatrist before going to a therapist, before going to his classmates or peers or friends, he needs to come to me as a father or, as a, or as, a, as a mother and talk to me about his issues. So I can do something about it because no one can be more sincere and protective of the child than their parents. Therefore, I need to establish that relationship friendship with my kids that the day they are in a trouble or going through a difficult time they come to me before going to anybody else before seeking help and sometimes for lack of aib or stigma our kids do not even seek help from anybody they keep it inside their heart which is not a good thing as well so as a parent I need to establish that relationship with my children. I need to become a friend with them. I need to give them the comfort of trusting me. And that's not going to happen unless I establish a friendship relationship with my kids. They need to view me as a friend, not as a dictator. There are parents who act like dictators. Do this, don't do that. That's it. There is no third choice. Either my way or no way. This is wrong, my dear brothers and sisters. We have to leave some space for negotiation and maneuvering between parents and their children. So, this is to build a trust relationship is an art. Not everybody knows how to do it. We need to focus on that. Number two, my dear brothers and sisters. We need to accept our kids as they are. What do I mean by that? There is a habit in many, particularly Muslim and Arab family, that the father turns to his son and he says, you know what, Abbas, you have to become a doctor, otherwise I will kick you out. You have to become an engineer. Okay, what if I don't want to become an engineer? What if I don't want to become a doctor? No, it's not up to you. It's up to me. You have to rasi. You have to make me proud in the community. I want you to become a doctor. That's wrong, my dear brothers and sisters. Why some of us think that the only way for me to excel in life is by becoming a doctor? There are other ways I can excel. And people differ in their potentials. Someone is good at being a doctor, but another person could be good at being or becoming a computer engineer. A scientist. So why I emphasize and I dictate on my son or my daughter something that is not part of their passion. I need to promote their passion. He wants to become an artist. That's fine. Encourage them. He wants to become a journalist. That's fine. Encourage them. Try to help them to meet 
and explore their potentials. Do not dictate on them your wishes and your standard. So, accept them as is. When my child comes home and he had his tests, results in his hand, some parents look at it. And if he doesn't have A+, plus, they put the child through hell. They yell, they scream, they basically insult, they use some very, very harsh word. I have a friend of mine, he was telling me every time I came home from exam, I would not go home. I want to go somewhere else because I was so afraid of my father. The minute I go home and he finds out I did not get A+, plus, he will tell me, Ahmar, enta. <laughs> this is not good, my dear brothers and sisters. I talked about before, I talked about using the right choice of word. A father, a mother should not at all use those profanities. They should not use those insulting words at all. At all. Be nice with your children. Do not assume that they are just a mass of flesh and meat. No, they have, they have feelings. And your word can have an everlasting impact on their personality. So, whatever they do, always encourage them. When he has B plus, tell him, God bless you, my son. God bless you, my daughter. I'm so proud of you. But inshallah, next time you will get A plus. Always be encouraging. And instead of being discouraging, there are children who told me whatever we did in school, we could not meet our parents' standard. They kept on belittling us. When I was in your age, I was always the first student. Well, what can I do? You're a genius. You're Einstein. I'm not Einstein. So, this is not a good way to deal with our children when we belittle them and we do not take in consideration their accomplishments. There is a verse in the Quran, very beautiful, my dear brothers and sisters. Very beautiful verse. See, we read the Quran. Some of us read the Quran. I know many Muslims don't even read the Quran. But for those who read the Quran, we hardly <coughs> contemplate on what we read. We hardly comprehend. There is a verse in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَبْخَسُ النَّاسَ أَشْيَاءً Give credit when credit is due. When someone does a good job, do not discredit them. Do not overlook their accomplishment. No matter how small. No matter how small. If you have a servant at home who comes every Sunday and sweeps your living or family room, and they clean it, say thank you to them. Acknowledge their accomplishment. Don't say, you know what? He has to do this. He's getting paid. Yes, I know he's getting paid, but you know, sometimes if it's not coming from my heart, I'm getting paid anyway. I will not do a great job. Let your servant or your helper feel he is cleaning his own home. How would he feel that way when you treat them nicely? When you acknowledge their accomplishment with our children, we need to always acknowledge their accomplishment. Now, I want to bring this to your attention, my dear brothers and sisters. Acknowledging our kids' accomplishment should not make us fall on another dangerous line, and that is spoiling them. We should not overstate their accomplishment as well.
We should not spoil our kids. We have to be realistic. Spoiling our children and doing everything they ask, that's a mistake as well. That's wrong. My kids have not reached the level of maturity to distinguish, to be distinguished, to be able to distinguish between good and right. They need my help. And therefore, sometimes they need my guidance. They need my leadership. So, do not listen to them at every turnaround and every request they make. Sometimes they make unreasonable requests. That may lead to harming them rather than helping them. So, watch. There is a borderline between acknowledging their accomplishments and between spoiling them. Do not spoil them, but acknowledge their accomplishment. Be encouraging. Do not discourage their morale. Do not weaken their morale. Always boost their morale. Tell them, you will achieve. I know you can achieve that. I know you're smart enough. Don't make them sound that no matter what they do, they cannot meet your standard. You have raised the standard so high that it looks insurmountable to them. No matter what they do, you're still unhappy with them. This is wrong. This is wrong, my dear brothers and sisters. I know there are some parents who are like this. They have so much high expectations from their children that no matter what they do, they are still not happy. They are still not satisfied. Number three, always lead by example. I can talk so much about honesty. I can give lectures about honesty, but I will deal a big blow to my speech, my longest speech about honesty when I do something that is dishonest. I can talk about how good it is to be an honest person, a truthful person. But when I make one lie before my kids, I ruin all of that. Our kids not only need preaching, preaching is good, to tell them be, to be trustworthy, to tell them to be unselfish, to tell them to be humble, but preaching to our kids is not limited to my word that I utter. Rather, it includes also my own character, my own personal conduct. You want your children to love one another. You have five kids, and sometimes you see that due to over competition over to <coughs> due to competition over certain issues, there could be some animosity or rivalry between your kids, and you don't like that. The best way to bring harmony to your children and teach them how to love one another is by you loving your siblings. I, I do not talk to my siblings. I don't visit them. I don't check on them. I have stopped talking to my brother because we fought over a gas station, yet I want my sons to love one another. This is called hypocrisy. If you want your sons to love one another, you need to love your brother. If you need, if you want your daughter to love her sister, you need to love your sister. If I do not reach out to my siblings, and I don't show any, any feelings for them, 
Why do you think my kids will be reaching out to one another? Makes no sense. I want my children to respect me as a parent. The best way you do this, you achieve that goal is by you respecting your parents. If I ignore my parents, I hardly check on them. I hardly visit, visit them. You think my kids will respect me? Trust me, no matter how nice you will be to your children, the underlying is you don't care about your parents, why we should care about you. If you want your kids to love you and respect you, you love and respect your parents. This is how you lead by example. And it will be more effective than any word you use, any preaching, fashion, or skill you use. If you want your kids to grow unselfish, you be unselfish. Don't call the mother and ask your wife before your kids, what are you cooking today? And she says, well, today your kids want to eat pizza. No, 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 I well, don't want pizza. I need them jaddara. And if they don't like them jaddara, khali ballatul bahar. No. You know, in fact, there is a hadith. Hadith, listen to this hadith. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam says, المؤمن يأكل بشهوة أهله والمنافق يأكل أهله بشهوته He says, a true mu'min is someone who eats with what his family desires. A hypocrite is the one who makes his family eat what he desires. There are some people who are completely selfish. He wants his wife and his five kids to eat what he likes. Accommodate me. Take care of me. Okay, what about your kids? To hell with them. I just need to have my favorite dish. That's wrong, my dear brothers and sisters. Always see what your wife and your kids want. If they like pizza, eat pizza with them. If they like some kind of food, eat with them. And if you do not want to eat because you don't like it, do not deny them. Do not deny them what they want. Go with them. I have a daughter who loves sushi. And I am someone who never ate sushi. That I don't even know what sushi is. Sometimes she says, Dad, I want sushi. Let's eat sushi. I say, Baba, unfortunately, I don't like sushi, but I will not deny you. We'll buy you sushi. We buy her sushi once in a while. So, my dear brothers and sisters, the point I'm trying to make is, do not always impose your own will and your desire on your, fa on your children. And then say, you know what? I have loving children. <laughs> of course, they have to be loving. They are not going to say no to you because they are polite. But that doesn't mean they are okay with that if you force them to eat mjaddara every day or mluhiya with all respect to mluhiya. Number number what? Number five. Before judging the reaction, judge the action. We often say, why those kids are acting that way? If you want to know, go and look, search for the, what made them react. It's a reaction. That's a reaction. Go and search for the action. Go and search for the reason that made them feel that way. Sometime I encounter young men and women who feel so bitter over the way their parents treat them. And they go harsh. And I told them that this is wrong. 
You cannot be harsh with your parents, no matter what. But at the same time, I understand why they feel that way. Because it is the parents who push them to feel that way. It is often the parents and their way of treating their children that makes their children feel alienated. The Prophet وسلم, who always preached respecting parents. I don't think any Prophet in the world had talked about respecting parents as much as our Holy Prophet did. And I mentioned last week one hadith that some of you were so amazed with that the Prophet says if someone, a son or a daughter looks at his or her parents with love and passion you will get the reward of Hajj. With one look, a man says to the Prophet, what if he looks a hundred times at his parents with love and passion every day? Will he get the reward of 100 Hajj? The Prophet says, if he looks with love and passion at his parents 100,000 times, he will get the reward of 100,000 Hajj. You go to Hajj, it takes you three weeks. To do Hajj. It takes you to spend about $10,000 and so much hassle and physical labor. You can get the reward of that by one look, one passionate look at your parent. Of course, I'm not saying that this will suffice for the mandatory Hajj. Mandatory Hajj, you have to go. If you have to go to Hajj, you have to go to Hajj. I'm not talking about the mandatory Hajj, the first Hajj. If you are physically capable, you have to go. No, we're talking about recommended Hajj. Mustahab. You look one, one time at your parent with love and passion, Allah will give you the reward of one Hajj. Now, the same Prophet who said this, he says, May God not bless parents who make their children go and grateful, who push their kids to be disrespectful. They cause that disrespect. They push their kids through the way they treat their kids, the harsh way they treat their kids, the harsh words they use, they make their children disrespectful. There is no justification for kids to go disrespectful, no matter what. But if they go disrespectful, God will hold the parents also accountable. You made them do that. You push them. Be nice to them. When your kids do something good to you, acknowledge that good. I have seen parents with my own eyes, wallahi, their kids do good things to them. So nice. And the mother says, غصباً عنك تعملين. You have to do this. She's not a slave. I know she's doing this out of her kindness to you. But you shouldn't treat her that way. You shouldn't make your child feel whether he does good to you or he doesn't good to you. It's the same. He is going to get the same compliment or no compliment. That's wrong, my dear brothers and sisters. When your child does something good to you, acknowledge them. Appreciate that. Say, God bless you. I'm so proud of you. I'm so indebted to you. Acknowledge and be appreciative. Trust me, my dear brothers and sisters, there is no bigger na'mah and bounty given to any human being by Allah than when you have a good son or a good daughter. It's worth more than billions. Billions of dollars. If you have billions of dollars, they will help you as long as you are walking on earth and breathing. The minute you stop breathing, your money will let you down. But when you have good kids, they will be your investment for retirement, when, for when you become old and after you die, they will become your investment. They will remember you through, through their deeds, through their good deeds, through their prayers, 
through their recitation of Quran. By leaving a good child behind, you continuously receive hasana from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, do not alienate them. If there is a problem with them, before blaming them, go and search for the root cause. Why they are acting this way? Why my son is doing this? It's easy for me to blame him for everything wrong he does. But it takes courage for me to admit that sometime it is my responsibility as well. It is my fault. I made him feel that way. I made him act that way. And finally, my dear brothers and sisters, in the Arabian, pre-Islamic Arabian Peninsula, it was a big stigma for a father to show love for his children. It was always viewed as a sign of weakness. Islam came and turned that over. Islam says, no, to love your children and to express your love for your children, that's not a sign of weakness. In fact, it is a sign of strength that you're a normal person. You are a normal individual. A normal individual shows love to his children. I will be abnormal. And need some therapy if I do not show love and pa compassion to my children. I need to seek therapy. The Prophet ﷺ was having Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein sitting in his lap one day. One minute kissing this boy, the other minute he kisses the other. One minute he kisses Hassan, the other minute he kisses Hussein. With, big, with the biggest smile on his face. That was the joy of the Prophet. You know, the Prophet really never had anything that ordinary people would. You go for a sport. You go for a movie theater. You sit and have a regular session. You watch your TV. The Prophet never had any of those. You know, entertainment tools to use. His biggest pleasure was when he would see his grandchildren, Hassan and Hussein. He would hug them. He would kiss them. A man, a, an Arab chieftain, who would command over a huge tribe, over six, seven thousand. He looks at the Prophet with despise with despise. He looks at the Prophet kissing. He says, Ya Rasulullah, what's a big deal about kissing those kids? I have 10 kids. I never kissed any of them. Bragging about that. Bragging about not kissing any of his children. About not expressing any love for his children. Because here I am. I am I'm a macho. I'm a very strong person. I'm a very powerful man. I don't show any sign of weakness. The Prophet looks at him and he says, What can I do? What can I do about it when there is no rahma in your heart? There is no love in your heart. Then the Prophet says, When you love your children, this is a rahma from Allah. When you express your compassion to your children, this is a sign of rahmah from Allah and mercy. God is giving you this mercy. You need to appreciate it. My dear brothers and sisters, I am getting to the end of my presentation. I need to tell you that today is the last day of our uh, Sunday lecture this year. I mean, not this year, actually, this till September. Uh, Ramadan is beginning next week on Monday, inshallah. 
and we're going to have a nightly program in English every single night of Ramadan for 30 nights. It's a little bit late, but I know most of you ishar anyway, you stay late. So our English program starts at 10.30 uh, in the evening, and I bet most of you are still awake at that time, and you still can join us. If you cannot join us every night, at least every other night, if not every other night, at least one or two nights a week. We're going to have nightly session here at the Islamic Institute. I would like to say Ramadan Mubarak to all of you. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you and to support you and accept your a'mal. Uh, after Ramadan, the summer break will start. I'm sorry, Hajjah, what did you say? Dinner. Okay, the dinner. On May 17th, the Women Auxiliary is holding a dinner, public dinner for the community at Vintage Bale Cultural Center. What day of the week is it, Hajj Dania? Friday. Friday, May 17th. And the timing, you know, it's time of iftar. You need to come an hour earlier because there is a program. And then, inshallah, we will. Uh, share the iftar together. I encourage you, my dear brothers and sisters, to buy the ticket and be there. We need to be and act as one family in the month of Ramadan. So we can share the beauty of Ramadan together. So I encourage you all to buy your ticket. Hajja Daniel, you have ticket. If you need to buy tickets, Hajja Daniel has the tickets. Also, the secretary at the front office has the tickets. You can purchase your tickets and come with your family members so we can enjoy the warmth of Ramadan. So, please make sure you make it to this dinner. And inshallah, our next session of the Sunday lecture will be after Ashura. Ashura will be over by uh, the September 10th, inshallah. So, probably a week after. Uh, Ashura, we will be resuming our Sunday lecture. Until then, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you, to support you, I hope, inshallah, and pray that you enjoy the summer break. And wherever you are, whether you are here or you will be traveling abroad, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect you and to keep you safe. I love you all, I respect you all, I will miss you all, but obviously, inshallah, we will have the Friday prayer. We have other activities here. We'll be continuing. Islam doesn't go to a vacation in summer. So yes, we will not have the Sunday lecture, but we will have other activities going on, inshallah, during summer. And I hope, inshallah, I can see you in other venues. And inshallah, in the month of Ramadan, uh, we will see you uh, at least uh, a few nights if you if you cannot make it every night. Allahumma ghfir lil mu'minin wal mu'minat wal muslimin wal muslimat al ahya'i minhum wal amwat tabi' allahumma baynana wa baynahum bil khayrat innaka mujib al da'wat innaka qadhi al hajat wa ila arwah al mu'minin wal mu'minat wa la siyama ila ruh al marhum al haj abdul karim dakrub al haj fawziya fawaz والمرحوم الحاج حسن مقلد نقرأ سورة المباركة الفاتحة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته